Hi and welcome back to Joe Talks Cars and welcome to another video. In this video I'm just going to cover what it's been like owning my Porsche Cayman S for the last 10 months, going through some of the costs, some of the pitfalls with owning one, and whether I'd recommend it to somebody else. So I get asked quite a lot why I bought this car, why I bought a Cayman S in particular. And I think it's quite simple really, just the way this thing looks. The curves on it, the classic styling, I just think looks absolutely fantastic. And for this price point of 14000 that's all I paid for this car. I don't think there's anything out there that looks better than this for that money. In regards to cost, these cars were quite expensive when they came out. So back in 2006, this car cost over £42,000. It's got around £11,000 worth of options on it, so it's got quite a lot of toys in it. It's not the most highly spec example, but it's perfect for what I wanted. It's got all the things that I think you sort of need on one. So like I said, I've done 6,000 miles on this car over the last 10 months. Most of it just kind of boring driving, I've just been going to work and to the shops and things like that, but I did do a 380 mile drive into the north of Scotland. The car was absolutely phenomenal. I had every type of weather that was possible. The car was just perfect. It was faultless, it was comfortable, and it was just such an enjoyable drive. But other than that, I've just been driving around the local area. So I haven't really had a chance to exploit the car's full potential. And that's one thing that's really been annoying through this lockdown. Once lockdown lifts, I intend to take this car out across Europe, maybe go to the Nürburgring, I want to do some drag races in it, and just put it through its paces and really unlock the potential of this car. Because it's something, until now, I haven't really had the chance to do. So one thing that I do get asked a lot with this car is whether the exhaust has been upgraded, or whether it's a standard exhaust. Well, the car's actually on a standard exhaust at the moment. I do actually plan on changing it to an aftermarket system, so if anyone has any suggestions on what exhaust I should be going for, then please drop a comment below. I'd love to hear your thoughts as there's quite a lot of choice out there, including going for something custom, which I've had on all my previous cars. I think either way the exhaust sounds brilliant, so I haven't been in any rush to get one done. And I want to make sure it's the right one and not something that's just going to drone and drive me absolutely crazy. So what I think we should do now, because it's started to snow again, is we'll go for a drive and I'll tell you what it's been like owning my Porsche Cayman S. So, what is it like to live with on a day-to-day -day basis, and what's it been like over the last 10 months of owning the car? Well, I think, to put it really simply, I've absolutely loved having it. It's just the best car I've ever owned by miles. To live with it every day is really, really simple, actually. Normally, cars like this, especially mid-engine sports cars, are really compromised. You can't always use them every day because either they're too loud, they're too uncomfortable, or they're just not practical if you can't use it as a car. And the Cayman just overcomes all of these issues that you would get with a tr traditional mid-engine sports car. It's super practical. Having two boots that are really, really decent size, I mean, that front boot, you'd be amazed what you can get in it. And the rear boot, again, it's surprising. You can get quite a lot into it. It makes it just so simple to live with every day, along with the two boots. There's just numerous cubby holes, some just over my shoulder, just over here. There's one in the central armrest. It's just really brilliant. It's super practical, and you just wouldn't expect that from a Porsche at all, would you? So let's talk about MPG. So you'll see a lot of people online saying they got high 30s out of theirs. It's not possible. The most I've ever had is around 33 on my run up to Scotland, which was 380 miles and the rain was really bad, so I had to take it really steady, and I'd only owned the car a couple of weeks, so I wasn't pushing it at all, and it got around 33, I think it might have even seen 34 at one point, but either way, it's not amazing considering that was borderline 50 miles an hour on the dual carriageway the entire way. Round town, you'll be looking at about 21, this sits at 21, I think you get slightly more out of a manual, with this being a Tiptronic it does cost about 1 or 2 mpg for that, but you didn't buy a Porsche to get really good mpg. So it's not something that I would worry about if looking for one. And it's not something that I would say to someone in order to put them off buying this. The MPG is just something you're just going to have to get used to if you want one. That is a small price to pay for that glorious soundtrack from that 3.4 flat 6, in my opinion. 
going back to the long run, on a drive, the suspension was not overly hard, so it was quite comfortable. The seats are really, really nice, and they're heated as well, so, so without sounding like a cliche, it's a really nice place to be for all that time. I got out feeling quite refreshed at the other end, to be honest, with its cruise control, automatic gearbox, and just going along the dual carriageways, it was really, really relaxing. I didn't get there exhausted or with my ears bleeding like you would with a car with a loud exhaust and typically a car like this. One of the absolute best things about this car is just simply the way it handles. I've talked about this in numerous videos and I still can't get used to the cornering speeds. The speeds you can send it into bends in this is just beyond all comprehension. It's far better than I am at driving so I know that I would never have the bravery to drive this at 100%. The car will always have way more in it than I have got. So it inspires so much confidence in the bends. And it makes even the most boring drives really fun in my opinion. Just driving to work, which typically is quite a boring drive, it just makes it enjoyable. I look forward to finishing work and getting back in the car and, and driving it home. And that's what I'd want from a daily driver, which is what this is to me. There are a few things, of course, that are a bit of a letdown with this car. One thing being, it has some horrendous rattles coming from the back. I've read a bit online and a lot of people say they're quite easy to fix, it's just the boot lid, but sometimes it just drives me mad, that noise. And it tends to be on roads like this, and, and sometimes even smooth roads. It's that same sort of noise you get when you have your window open on a motorway, it's just awful. You can't turn the speakers up and get rid of it you can just permanently hear it and it's horrendous. Like I said, there are fixes for this and it's something that I want to do pretty soon because it's driving me nuts. Like I touched on at the start of this video, the car is quite well specced. It has lovely heated seats, sport seats, it's got all the things you'd want. But with it being an old car, it is sort of lacking in the technology department. On my long drive, all I had was my CD stacker and a radio and it got tiring after a while. Once each of those CDs had been round, I was really quite bored. There's no Apple CarPlay because it's so old. And although the speakers sound really, really nice, there's no way of plugging your phone in, so it can be quite frustrating. It's something that I'm going to look at upgrading because there's some really good aftermarket options out there. Even ones that look like they're factory fitted, which is what I'd be really interested in. Although they are very expensive. One thing that you do never get bored of is the power. It's only got 300 horsepower, but honestly, it feels like it's got 400. The way this thing picks up and takes off, it's really, really impressive. I think that's just down to the fact it's really, really lightweight. So it doesn't take a lot of power to get it moving. I would say one of the major downsides to this car is I just don't use it to its full potential. I haven't owned the car that long, and with COVID, there has been so many restrictions in place. I haven't been able to do what I wanted with it, really. Although these are really nice roads, it's quite dangerous to push the car too hard, especially when you're not used to it. I really do need to get it to a track day and really unleash the full potential of this car. I just feel like I'm probably using about 40% of it most of the time and I think that's just a bit of a shame with this car. They're designed to be driven and driven hard and I just, I don't get the opportunity to. A weird criticism I have of this car is it does everything perfectly. You hear about it with so many Porsches that they lack soul and everything, and I, I don't think it lacks soul. What I think that it is sort of lacking is a human-like quality, because it does everything perfectly. It doesn't have human-like qualities, so it's kind of hard to get attached to the car. I absolutely love the car, don't get me wrong, it's, it is one of the best cars I've ever owned, or the best car I've ever owned, but I don't think I love it yet. I don't think I love it in the same way I did my Renault Megane, which is really crazy to say, and you're all going to be going mental in the comments now, but I see this car as more of a precision tool. It's like dismantling a building. If you took it down brick by brick and carefully, methodically took, broke it down, it wouldn't be that much fun. But if you just got a hammer and just started smashing at it randomly, it would be a lot more fun, and, to, and that's what it's like with this car. The Megane was just like one massive hammer and it didn't really work properly and it wasn't the best car in the world at all. It was terrible in so many ways, but I loved it. And with this car, it's almost, almost too perfect. 
you can use it every day. You can fill the boots up, you can go shopping. It's not compromised. It can get over speed bumps. It's quite comfortable. It's not that horrific on fuel. And as you'll find out later, it hasn't cost me all that much money. But it's just lacking something. It's just a little bit clinical. It might be something that grows on me over time. And I think a lot of cars, at first, you don't necessarily love them. And then after a while, you do get attached to them. And I think this could be one of those cars. Over time, I may learn to love it. But at the moment, I just admire it. I find it amazing, I find it brilliant, but I don't love it like I did my previous car. One thing that I will say is that this car fits my lifestyle perfectly, and it's pretty much the reason why I will be hanging on to this car for many, many more years to come. I wanted a car that was a bit more mature than what I've previously had, and I think that ticks these boxes. With it being silver, it, it's very, very classy looking, and I have grown up, I'm not that stupid anymore. I used to like cars with pop and bang maps and really loud exhausts with flames coming out the back. I used to love that, but not anymore. I just, I'm sick of people shaking their heads at me as I drive past and you don't get that with this car. You just get admiring glances and people going, oh, look at that Porsche, isn't it beautiful? And, and it, because it is, it's, it's a classic car in some ways. It's definitely a modern classic. With regards to prices, I've spoken to a lot of people over the last few weeks have been asking me for advice on buying them and how much I paid for it and one thing I have noticed is that most people are saying the price I paid is not really a good enough budget anymore so 14,000 won't really get you one as th this good anymore and that's amazing because I thought this was quite a healthy budget and when I went to look for one I had quite a few to pick from and it just seems as though the prices are going up so for any potential buyer that is brilliant news you could potentially buy one of these, run around in it for a year, and get your money back. So that's great. And when I went to look to buy one of these, it is one thing I did consider was the value at the end of it. I didn't want a car that was just gonna sit on my driveway and lose loads of money. I wanted something that was either going to lose a small amount of money or, or potentially even gain some money. I'm not saying that that is what this is going to do, but we can hope. So why did I choose a Porsche Cayman? And why specifically did I pick the Cayman S? Most people will tell you that that car is riddled with bore scoring and it's to be avoided at all costs. And if you are considering the S, you need to be looking at the 987.2 rather than one. The main reason for me was just I wanted a car with a big engine and the 2.7 for me was just a little bit too small. I've covered this in previous videos. I just wanted a car that was just fast out of the box with no messing around. I've always had to mess around with cars to get performance out of them and I didn't want to do it again, so I took the risk and bought the 3.4. Right, so now I think we're going to go and treat myself to a coffee at McDonald's and I'm going to go through some of the costs that I've had with this car and some of the future costs that inevitably I'm going to have to start shelling out for. I don't know if someone could actually answer this for me, but McDonald's has been open for months now since lockdown and every time you come there's a massive queue. I know I'm here, but, and I'm only getting a coffee, but Jesus Christ. Every single time you come, every McDonald's, they're just massive, massive queues. Is it because nowhere's open, or have we all just now got a real appetite for McDonald's? Is it what's got us through lockdown? I, I really don't know. But it's huge. Hi, what can I hear? Hi, can I have a double quarter pounder meal, please? Yeah, what drink? Um, could I have a, a latte with it, please? Yeah, you can have. That's everything, cheers. Can you start? No, thank you. Uh, cheers, man. Take cheers. Care. Well, that escalated quickly. I only came for a coffee. Maybe that's why we're all fat. Can't resist the McDonald's. I was sat in the queue that long, I just saw a massive sign of double quarter pounder and thought, well, I haven't had any lunch. That's my excuse anyway. It never ceases to amaze me how brutally efficient McDonald's is at extracting money from our wallets. There's no wonder why we're all getting fatter. It's just too easy to go to McDonald's. Like I said, I only came for a coffee and now look what's happened. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers, bye. So now I'm feeling refreshed and I've got my coffee here. We're going to go through some of the costs. Some of the costs that I've already had in the last 10 months and some that are going to be coming up in the next few weeks and months. To give you an idea on what it's cost me over a 10 month period. So up until now, the only costs I've had with this car is a service that cost about £720. That was for the gearbox and the 
main service as well. It was a full major service. I've had my road tax, which with it being the 3.4, it's very, very expensive. It's uh, £500 so far in this last 10 months. I pay it monthly because it's just too much to bear paying out that much in one go. The insurance, I'm very, very lucky with insurance. It's extremely cheap. So in the 10 months, it's only cost me £230 to insure. So it's absolutely amazing, really. In terms of repairs, the only repair I've had to make on the car was an AOS. Really, really common on these to go. Just causes huge plumes of smoke out the back and it's quite an easy fix and that cost a hundred other than that i've had to put an mot on it that is all i've had to do so that is all the costs i've had so that gives a total of 1585 pounds which for a porsche over 10 months it's absolutely incredible the only thing i haven't factored in is fuel because to be honest the prices have fluctuated so much i don't know how much it even is now so i can't really give you an idea of how much fuel i've spent so let me cover some of the costs that are going to be coming up in the next few weeks and months. So an obvious one will be tyres. They're really, really expensive on these because you have to have N-rated tyres. These are the 19-inch wheels, so they're much larger, which means they cost more. I've been looking at the Michelin Pilot Sports as they're really, really recommended by a lot of people. But they come in for a full set, about £950, so it's quite a lot and it's the most I've ever spent on tyres. I will be documenting that just... To get more accurate costs near the time but after a quick look online that's sort of around about the figure i'm looking at which is pretty horrific it's worth mentioning these tires are quite old the tread on them is really good but they're, they're very very old now when you go to look at one of these just make sure that the tires are not only good but they aren't actually that old it's a trap that i just fell into i saw the car and thought the tires are really good there's loads of tread on them but there's more to tires than just tread so be sure to check the year they were made so in conclusion would i recommend this car I still would, 10 months on, and I definitely would recommend it still to anyone. They're such brilliant value for money. And although they're not without their pitfalls, reliability with the engine being one of them, if you find a good example and you maintain it, there is no reason why it won't give you many, many miles of pain-free motoring. And do I still love the car? Well, like I said earlier, I don't necessarily love it, but I admire it. I enjoy the car. It is the best car I've ever driven, and... I don't know of a car that I'll ever drive as good as this. The handling and everything is just exceptional. Do I have any regrets? A lot of people will be thinking, well, obviously you'll regret the gearbox. I don't regret the gearbox. I've been through this in many, many videos and it just fits my lifestyle perfectly. So I don't regret that. I somewhat regret not having the extra bit of cash just to go for a generation two. That way I wouldn't have had any of the worry in the back of my mind about possible bore scoring. Those cars are largely unaffected, so... I think doing it again, I would have probably spent the extra money on a 987.2. That's not to say that this is a bad car and that the engine's just going to randomly explode. I don't think it is, and I don't think it has got ball scoring. But it's just a niggle at the back of your mind, which it doesn't go away for me. That would be the only regret I'd have. So hopefully you've enjoyed this video, and it's been helpful. It's given you an idea on what it's like to run a Porsche for 10 months. I think you'll be surprised by how much it's cost, and... Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. See, do you think it's more or less than you expected? And let me know also if you have a Porsche Cayman, how much does it cost you every single month to run? Be really interesting to see if they vary between the 2.7, the 3.4, and even newer or older versions. It'll be really interesting to get an idea of whether this is typical or I've been very, very lucky. So anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed this video. If you have, if you can give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already for plenty more videos to come. Bye.